Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, we don't have a lot of time for, it's hard to cover 75 years of a business, so I'm just going to talk about a couple things that, that sort of the entrepreneurial spirit has, uh, that I've been able to implement in this, this old business. So on the, I um, just want to make sure you've seen what I'm saying. On the left here, you can see this is so, sort of the, the opening day on the top picture of when um, uh, my great-grandmother opened the business. And in 1946, uh, World War II was just ending. And how did two women start a business in a really rough neighborhood? Well, you can see their names, Freddie and Mo. So they had man, men's names. So they were able to start this business in a really tough neighborhood. And, um, and it's been going for 73 years now. And you can see some pictures on the top there. And then uh, below them is the, uh, the appropriate businesses, how they look today. I'm going to show you a quick video to give you a little background. And then we'll move forward. Welcome to Newport, Oregon. home of the world-famous Moe's Clam Chowder. For over 70 years, Moe's has been a favorite on the Oregon coast. Meet the legendary Moe's great-grandchildren, Gabrielle and Dylan. So this is where it began in 1946, more than 70 years ago. Still a family-owned business today, and family members still work here. My great-grandmother Mo started this business. She was kind of a hard drinking, smoking, huge personality. Everybody knew her in Newport. She had a radio show. These two ladies, both with sort of male names, Mo and Freddie, opened up this uh, little tiny restaurant on uh, Newport's Bayfront. Long before it was discovered by tourists, they catered to longshoremen and fishermen, and so it was pretty rough and tumble in those days. So in 1946, she just purchased out her best friend, Freddie. It got so busy and popular that she opened up Moe's Annex just across the street. They had the benefit of windows right over the bay. So um, that was really fun for customers to watch our working harbor. Then it got so busy that she put another one in Otter Rock. And that's a little tiny Moe's with about eight tables. Um, it's seasonal, um, but if you've never been out there, it's pretty fun. Then she expanded to Taft then in Florence, and then she went to Cannon Beach, and now there's one in Astoria. And there's also one at the airport. In our 70 years in business, we've had a few um, kind of famous people come in. Bobby Kennedy stopped here when he was running for president. They had the filming of Sometimes a Great Notion, and that had Paul Newman and Henry Fonda and Lee Remick in it. Moe's became kind of like their place that they would go when they were done filming or having a day off. They ate here every night, they partied here every weekend. It was an awesome experience for her. Mo built her brand on stories and all these famous people that she became friends with, but people come back to feel the atmosphere and have the food, which is just as high quality as anywhere you'll find it, and it's always fresh, and it's always from the Oregon Coast, and that's what we promise. The food at Mo's is, is simple and that's always been kind of our signature. We don't do a lot of um, crazy sauces on our fish, and I really like that because my belief is that the fish just needs a little cooking and is actually just perfect the way that it is. Mo became famous for her clam chowder, but we also have lots of other dishes that are very tasty. One of our newer items that's very popular, fish tacos. We make this incredible um, jalapeno cilantro sauce, and now we're also making you know, our own pico de gallo to go with it. And of course, everybody's favorite, fish and chips. We have halibut fish and chips, beer battered. We have cod fish and chips, breaded. They're both very, very popular. We also have traditional dishes like a salmon steak or a halibut steak. You can get those grilled or charbroiled. They're just fantastic staples. My brother and I developed a fundraising program, much like um, you know, you have kids coming to your door with the cookie dough or, you know, beef jerky or wrapping paper, you know. Um, so this is the same idea. You pre-order our clam chowder base, the same stuff that we start with here every day. And it's been a fantastic success. So some schools have made, you know, upwards of two or three thousand dollars, depending on how many quarts of base they sell. Our goal here, even after 70 years, is a high quality customer experience great tasting food and being treated with the utmost respect with their whole family, little children, all the way up to grandma and grandpa. 
We stopped for a bite to eat here at Moe's. Great food, great service, friendly people. Um, the food was so great that we had to get Moe's shirts. Eat like a pirate and drink like a fish. <laughs> Okay, so there's a little background on our business. Um, I'm, the, I'm the only member of the church in my family, and so uh, you can see that there, we've had, we've had a, a sordid history uh, with my, my, my legacy of, of grandparents. It's been, uh, it's been a great uh, and tremendous honor to, to be a part of a, a family legacy, but I'm going to talk to you today about how do you stay relevant. So a couple things I'm going to touch on is uh, understanding your customers, uh, socioeconomic trends, uh, marketing trends, and innovative uh, product and production. These are some of the things that we've worked on since uh, taking over the business. So, in, in, um, so this is a little profile of our, our customers from 1942 to about 1970. You can see that only about 5% of our customers were tourists. 20% were loggers, longshoremen about 25%, and fishermen were about 50%. And off to the side there, you can see the menu. And I, I wish we could still offer this menu today, but T-bone steak for $2. That's, that's not something we can do and, and continue to stay in business. Um, Italian spaghetti and garlic bread, 90 cents. So I guess college kids, you guys appreciate those prices, I guess, but you would have to be time warped back to 1942. Um, so this, this neighborhood, the Bayfront, it used to be only fishermen. Longshoremen are those guys that load the cargo ships, and the cargo ships, you know, they head out to Japan or, or Korea or wherever with, their, with the logs and uh, with other things. Uh, very tough neighborhood. You had to have sort of a tough, uh, I guess, vocabulary of language. So we had to uh, adjust to some changes uh, between 1970 and 1985, a couple of events happened. Um, Robert F. Kennedy stopped by in his presidential campaign. That was June of 1968. Uh, side note here, he, he was uh, assassinated three days later. 1970, a movie called Sometimes a Great Notion, starring Paul Newman and Henry, Henry Fonda, filmed on the waterfront and used Moe's Annex as their hub for their cast and crew. Um, up until the day Moe died, she received uh, Christmas cards from uh, both Henry Fonda and Paul Newman. Uh, she had a huge personality. Um, she, uh, she just sort of became a, uh, a, a person to know if, if you knew anybody in Oregon. Uh, she became quite famous, quite famous in all Hollywood as these people went back and, and talked to their friends, and then she would receive visitors from time to time, um, various celebrities, and even after she died, um, my mom was receiving visitors from uh, people like, uh, maybe you may not know him because you're too young, but uh, Ernest Borgnine and um, Daryl Hannah and just famous people all around just hearing about the restaurant and, and our family's business. You can see here how uh, those events caused our, our demographic of customer to change. We have tourists now at 25%, uh, fish plant workers at 15%. Uh, local families started coming down to the Bayfront. Back in the day, local families wouldn't come down. It was just too rough for families. And fishermen dropped to about 40%. So the tourists were sort of pushing out the longshoremen and the fishermen. The picture on the bottom there, that's Paul Newman carrying a chainsaw in front of the restaurant as it looked back in the day. Okay, so 1985 to the present, a couple other things happened. Uh, Newport received um, an aquarium that they built there. It's a top 10 world aquarium. It's an excellent aquarium. Uh, you can see it in the picture there. There's a tunnel you can walk through the shark tank. And then um, uh, the movie Free Willy, the whale uh, Keiko was, was housed there at that aquarium. And so people were, came, came from all over to see uh, Free Willy. And, and I don't know if any of you, did you guys see that movie, Free Willy? Anybody heard of that? Anybody heard of an orca? Just making sure. Okay. Real quick, anybody, anybody heard of Moe's on Oregon Coast? Raise your hand. So a couple of you. Any of you ever been to a restaurant? You know what those are? 
They cook food? Okay, just want to make sure we're on the same page. So you can see how, uh, so the blue lines there are, are where our demographic spread approximately um, 42 to 70. Um, the red is 1970 to 1985. You can see it's sort of transitioning. And then the yellow is sort of the demographic today. So you can see that tourists went from basically zero to um, you know, almost 70% of our business today. Um, the government is a, is, a bit, is a big part of our, our industry in, the, um, in that area. There's a lot of government uh, installations there. Oregon State University has a graduate program there for biology. NOAA, uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, is in Newport. Um, so the demographics have changed quite a bit. Fishermen still come in, but it's mo mostly in the wintertime, like right now. In the summertime, they just they fish and then they leave the bayfront. There's just too many tourists on the bayfront. So when I started working in the business, I, I kind of wanted to know where all these people were coming from, and I thought it was an important idea to figure out. Um, when I came back to work in 2000 for the family, uh, the internet had just started rolling, and I had purchased a um, a web address, moshatter.com, and um, I thought, well, so someday there will be a way to, to reach these customers through uh, a website. Um, and I thought, well, what's the most effective way to find these people and to reach them, and, and how do I know where to advertise? So I tried, to, I tried in order to determine this, I came up with this, this idea. I was president of the local merchants association at the time, and I came up with this idea where we had a basket, and we had this giveaway for Christmas. And everybody that came into the restaurant or any one of the merchant businesses, had to, if they wanted to win it, they had to put their name, their phone number, and their address down. And we collected like 10,000 of these, uh, these, these entries. We gave away the basket, and I kept all the entry forms. And I, I, I made a database of where all these towns were. And I realized where, these, where each, we have eight locations along the coast, and I realized where everybody was coming from through these entry forms. It was, a, it was sort of a, it was a brilliant sort of guerrilla marketing idea. So the stars are where our locations are on the right here, and uh, the pink bubbles are sort of the reach where most of the people are coming. People come from all over the world, but if you're gonna spend money on advertising, you wanna get the people that were, are the closest to you right now, and so, Newport, for example, um, I, I knew that 65% of my, my business was coming from Corvallis, where Oregon State is, Albany, Lebanon, Sweet Home, Bend, uh, Redmond. And so it, it became really, really helpful for where we where we're going to put like things like billboards, what magazines or newspapers to advertise in. But we didn't... Uh, but, there's not a lot of things that are the same as back then in 2000. So we, in 2000, we were advertising in things like um, newspaper magazines, travel magazines. We had brochures, uh, radio ads, and billboards. And that, those were basically the mediums of advertising back then. And today, things have changed qu quite a lot. Since, the, since Facebook and, and other social media outlets... Um, Today, this is where we spend our money. So the light blue is where we used to spend our money pre-2006. From 2006 forward, our, we've shifted to this. We don't use any travel magazines. We print zero brochures. Uh, we still use billboards. And the data that I gathered just from those entry forums really allowed us to put billboards in the right place. Our newspaper ads have gone down to almost zero. And they're usually just ads telling people if there's a special event happening. Uh, most of our mo ad money now goes to Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Yelp, TripAdvisor, and Google Ads. Um, it's important, though, that if you own a business, that you, Google will have a page for you, Facebook has a page for you, Yelp, TripAdvisor, they all have pages for you. You have to go on and claim them as your pages. So you have to go through a process to prove that it's you that owns those businesses. And once you do prove that, you're allowed to log in and respond to reviews, which is very important. So, and the, the great thing about the ads on um, Facebook, Instagram, and all these other uh, social media ads is you can actually list the towns that you want to advertise in. So you can be very, very, ex extremely specific, age, uh, gender, anything you want. So what's the best marketing tool today? 
Does anybody have any idea? You guys have taken business classes for a couple years now, right? Yeah. Word of mouth. Yeah. So back in when, when my grandma started the business in '42, best advertising, word of mouth. Today, it's still word of mouth. But word of mouth happens a little bit differently today, right? So back in the day in '42, you had to like talk to people. You had to make put a lot of ads out. You, I mean, word of mouth was a lot more difficult. So today, these are the tools that we use to get word of mouth around. So Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Snapchat, and I, I want to talk to you quickly about, about one of them. So the other, the other ones are sort of obvious, but, but Snapchat is great. So Snapchat is, you can, you can develop a, a geofence around your business. You, can, you upload a filter. Has anybody done this yet? OK, so lots of you. OK, perfect. <laughs> Zero. Um, so this is great. So people are at your restaurant, and they're having a good time. And they take a picture of themselves, and then, it, wait, first of all, how many people use Snapchat in here? Okay, so like everybody. Okay. So have you guys ever used a geo filter? Everybody. Okay. So you put, your, you put your logo on there, and maybe a cute logo. So the one on the right is our Mosaics one, and the one in the middle is our original location, and the one on the left is our airport location, and they're, every filter is, is unique to the location and the town that they're in. So, so now that you have, you're looking at your friend's story, and you're like, oh, that, that's a cute filter. Or, oh, they're at Moe's. So now you have your logo on their face. And wouldn't you, don't you trust your friend's opinion over an advertisement on TV? Your friend's opinion is way more important, right? Word of mouth is, is crucial. So let me give you an idea how this, how this has worked for us. So uh, on the left, you see our Cannon Beach location. Uh, 20,000 20, people have seen the filter, so that, that crossed their eyes. Uh, 4,000 people use the filter, and, and almost 170,000 people saw their friends with your logo on their face. It's basically saying, I approve this place. I approve this message. And they're doing it for you. So you're not spending any money other than the filter. The filter costs three to $800 for a year. And it automatically renews. You can change the filter anytime you want. You can add the filter, change the filter. When we had the, do you guys remember the eclipse that was last summer? Well, in Oregon, it went right over us, and we actually got almost pitch black. And so we had a new filter for that. And anytime you have a special event, you can change the filters. And the one on the right here is our airport location. Lots of traffic goes through there. And I don't remember the, the, the time frame for this one here, but 215,000 people saw their friends with our logo on their face. So it's a little bit, it's kind of like a guerrilla marketing tactic. And it's super easy to do. Um, and it's very, very cheap. There's a couple uh, products I want to talk to you about. Other ways that you can get, uh, get your name out there, no matter what the product is, what you're doing. Uh, arts happens to be food and restaurants. It can be to any product. So other than the day-to-day -day restaurant operations, we have a factory that makes clam chowder. And that's its sole purpose, is making clam chowder. It also makes all of our sauces, too. But you want consistency all the way across the board. And so that's why we have a factory just for those items. Uh, it makes two products. It makes, on the left there, you see a one-pound barrier bag. Uh, it's a very strong bag. It, you, cannot, you can puncture it. But if you can't. Scratch it, you can't do anything. You have to, you have to take scissors and cut through it. You've, you could jump on it and stand on it, and it will not break. Um, that we use. We sell out of the restaurants, and we also sell to, uh, as a fundraiser. Um, and the, on, the, on the right there, we have a frozen product that my grandpa uh, implemented. Uh, that's actually a tofu container that just has a label printed on top and sealed, and it's frozen clam chowder base. And we ship that to grocery stores across uh, the Pacific Northwest. And that, that product, since the business cycle on the coast is very cyclical, in the summertime, we have more business than we can handle. In the wintertime, all the tourists and whatever, they all go back to school. Kids go back to school. Families have to go work. The weather's crappy. Nobody wants to come to the coast. Um, they want to go skiing instead. So you've got to find a product. How, how do you get to even out that business cycle? Well, we've done two things. One, we developed a fundraiser, which I'm going to talk to you about. And two, we ramp up on the retail product. So, who wants hot chowder when it's 100 degrees out? Nobody. But in the wintertime, when it's raining in Oregon and Washington, everybody wants clam chowder. 
And that's just, it's just part of the culture there is, is eating fish and clam chowder. So that product, we sell about 10,000 cases of that a year, and it's, it's a great way to even out the, uh, the business cycle for us. But I'm going to talk to you about the fundraisers. So the fundraisers are great. So I talked about the cyclical na nature of our business. Uh, the fundraiser, what did it do? It created a new revenue stream for us that we didn't have before. It keeps our employees working. We used to have to lay employees off in the, in the wintertime. Now we don't do it as much. Um, it gets your product out to the people and you utilize their sales force to push your product. So they, they call you up and they say, yeah, I want to raise money for our band to travel to Pasadena to be in the Rose Bowl. You say, okay, so this is what you're going to do. And we send them a packet full of information. And they send out 100 kids, or however many kids they have, and they go door to door throughout their community selling our product. And um, we're not doing anything. We have spent zero money selling our product at that point. Then they call us and they say how, they say how many quarts they have sold. And then I deliver it to them. And it's kind of like, I just bring it in a trailer and I drop it off wherever they want it and it works great. Um, just, in fact, today, my sister and my truck driver are delivering uh, 2,500 quarts of it. So and we do that a couple times a month throughout the winter months. So it allows you to, the other thing it does, it allows, so I personally like to do these deliveries. I could send my truck driver every time, but I personally like to do it. It means something different when the owner of the business is contacting a customer face to face. It's not just the customer. This guy is in charge of the sales force that just sold you all your product. So you could talk to them, what worked for you, what didn't work for you, how can we help you next year? We would like to help you raise your goal a little bit. How can we help you improve? And it's great for customer interaction. And it also gives you a persona. You need more than a persona. You need to actually be that. But gives you that impression to the communities around you that you are very socially conscious about helping and, and helping others make money and not being selfish like some capitalist is just trying to take all your money. So that's pretty much, I went it short and I kind of talked fast because there's usually a lots of questions. I've spoken at the University of Oregon, Portland State, Oregon State numerous times, and there's usually tons of questions, but of course they're all in Oregon, they all know who we are, so, uh, but you guys don't. I figured there may be more questions. So, any questions? <laughs> this is, yeah, so this is, yeah, questions, comments, and emotional outbursts. So most businesses, they struggle when you grow too much. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's definitely a problem. It's like, for example, I, I'm, I'm just getting ready to um, put together a package to uh, put our retail product, the frozen product, in front of Trader Joe's. So if we get that, if we get that contract, that be, would be great. But I currently have a, a packaging system that wouldn't handle it. So, but I don't want to buy a new system until I get a contract that requires it. But... I might need to. So yeah, so growing at a, a certain rate is kind of getting your ducks in a row, and it can be painful at times. So how do we control eight units along the coast? So I, I currently control three on day-to-day -day business and the chowder factory. And then we have, we started another business, we call it, it's our expansion arm. And that has a board of directors, and it has, um, it, we own part of that company, we work with them daily. So that's the expansion arm. So that way we don't get too strung out. We work together as a team to make sure that it happens at a, at a consistent rate and doing it correctly. So controlling growth can be hard, and, but doing it the right way is, is hard. But putting the systems in place so you can control that is super helpful. And so uh, but that, every business is going to have its own, own challenges. But a lot of times people bring a business up to a certain point and they're like, it's too big of an animal for what we have going on. And that's when it becomes something that you sell to a company that, I mean, at some point, um, you never know. We could sell our business. There are companies out there that own, all they own is ch restaurant chains. And so they may say, they may look at our product and go, we can take this. They're, they're not utilizing this business to its, its fullest. We can take it beyond. And so you may get purchased. You may not, you see, but you may figure it out on your own. Um, it's hard. Every business is totally different, though. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So we source all of our stuff uh, within Oregon, except for our clams from the clam chowder. 
So a lot of people don't know that people say, why don't you get your clams from Oregon? There's no commercial clamming on the West Coast for the types of clams that go in clam chowder. I mean, you can make it with anything. Uh, we can't commercial clam, and there isn't any commercial clamming. 90% of the world's clam stores come from Maryland. And so our clams are trucked over from Maryland. And so they come in a big 18-wheeler, and we stick them in our, our freezer and pull them out as we need them. Uh, other than that, everything comes from the Pacific Ocean. Tillamook Cheese is just north of us. We drive through there to go between locations all the time. I don't stop and get ice cream too much. But it may happen. Mary, Mary, my wife's in the room. Please don't ask me questions like that. She doesn't, she doesn't need to know that I stop and get ice cream. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so being in business for 70 years, and we, we have uh, eight or nine locations, is it nine? We're still opening one up in Seaside uh, this year. Um, it, we have expanded slowly, so it's been more of an organic. We're not a business that was born in a boardroom, okay? Like, um, like a Red Robin or an Outback or something like that. Everything that they do is planned out, right? Our business sort of grew organically, and it's just now starting to expand. We're starting to expand at a more rapid pace. So um, we've had locations that haven't worked that we thought would work, and they didn't. We had one in Albany on the river. It was really cute. It was in a caboose. It didn't work. We had to shut that one down. It was poorly managed um, and too far away from the hub of management. And then we had one in the town called Coos Bay. And then it was in an old dilapidated building, and the state decided that they needed to put a highway through our building. And so naturally, we got out of the way for the cars to come through. And instead of relocating in that town, we just left that town. Um, so things are going to uh, happen for you, and things won't. But we were much more of an organic growth. Now we're becoming more of a concept uh, that we can replicate in other places. And just in the last three years, we've added uh, Astoria, the airport, and this year we're adding Seaside. So it's growing at a more rapid pace right now. Any other questions? Yeah. Seaside is uh, directly lateral over from Portland. Yeah, I'm just saying it's the end of the where Lewis and Clark was. Yes. Where, where are you uh, kind of located? Um, it's right in the promenade. So there's a promenade there, and, and everybody knows kind of where the, Shil if the Shiloh Inn is. Yep, yep. So there's a Shiloh Inn there, and Shilohs decide they don't want to run their restaurant business anymore. <laughs> and so they've asked that we would come in and run that for them. And so, yeah, we're putting a Mo's there. And there's one on the waterfront in Astoria, which is where the Astor Column was, where Lewis and Clark, yeah, you've been there? Yeah, they hit the, they hit the end of the road there. And um, there's a place down there called Cape Disappointment. And that named by Lewis and Clark, you know why they named it Cape Disappointment? They were really bummed out when they got there. They might have been disappointed, yeah, yeah. It was rainy and awful. They must have showed up in the wintertime. <laughs> yes? Yeah, so, um, so Newport Pacific is the name of the, the business that we use to expand, and we're developing management procedures for that, developing managers and communication. I, the internet has changed, has really changed everything and allowed us to communicate better with our managers. And, uh, and re like every day, I get a report. We have a system uh, called No Wait. It's actually just purchased by Yelp where you step up, instead of standing in line, you give them your phone number and you get a text between tables ready. This is, you guys have probably experienced this. Um, and every, I get a report every day from that, lets me know how many people came through the door. I get a report from our micro system, lets me know exactly, you know. So you know real time what's going on at all the locations. And so uh, systems like that in place have really helped out a lot and they're, it's making expansion much easier and much faster. Any questions? A lot of times we get emotional outbursts, so those are fine too. But I'm not a therapist. Um, I'm kind of curious about family businesses because it's sort of like family. Yeah. Dad, do you like cooking or do you Yeah, so, so my, my sister and I, we've actually uh, spoken at, 
at Chamber of Commerces and Rotary Clubs around Oregon, and we get this question all the time, what's the best and the worst part about working in a family business? And, they're, and surprisingly, they're the identical same thing. Best and the worst thing about family businesses is working with your family. So, so family is great. Who loves their family? I think everybody loves their family. Has anybody had an argument with your family before? It happens, right? And when there's money on the line and there's differences of opinion and there's uh, differences of management opinion and how you want to take care of things, it can get dicey. Um, and and it's a, that's, actually, that's actually a loaded question and it's a huge question because there's so much that goes involved with it. Um, I, have, I have a friend that graduated from Harvard Business and he actually helps businesses work through their problems, family businesses, and he mediates for them. And so I, I definitely recommend doing that kind of stuff. We haven't needed anything like that yet, but it's something that we're definitely talking about, hiring a mediator uh, once a year to come in and, and just run a meeting, help us go through the business, find out what's not working, what's working. Uh, a lot of times in family businesses, you, you sort of resort back to how you argued when you were like 8 and 10 and 12 years old, right, which is super childish, right, and which, which doesn't work in a, in a business atmosphere, right. So uh, one of the things is division of duties. Make sure that's clear. So my sister and I, we actually rarely argue. Um, we rarely disagree on anything because we've, we've formulated division of duties within the business fairly well, and they don't really overlap all that much. Um, so that, that's one way to avoid arguments is making sure everybody understands. And then staying out of the other one's way. I mean, you can offer an opinion, but if it's their job, you know, offer your opinion and then let them mull it over. Uh, if, it's, if you don't want them doing that in your part of the business, then don't do that in their part of the business. So separation of duties and talents is super important. Yes? I know there's a big season, right, in your business. And did you experience any like, season with a low profit? And how did you manage it? Yeah, I mean, so like right now, like January is the worst. Right? So January, we're just like, I just hope we make it through. I mean, I hope we don't go out of business. You'll go through these periods where it's super, like, the Oregon coast, it's not like California's coast. California's coast, it's pretty much hot and sunny year-round, right? Oregon, no. It's like 65 to 68 in the summertime, and it's about 45 to 50 degrees in the wintertime, and raining 70 miles an hour sideways. Okay, whoops. That's how fast. <laughs> yeah, so it's super, super cyclical and people don't want to come down to the storms and all that kind of stuff. So you do have to develop a way to flatten out that business cycle, which is why we came up with these other two products, and it helps a lot, but not as much as a line out your door like we have in the summertime. So any other questions, comments, concerns, emotional outbursts? Yes, sir. Yeah, so, um, the, the smallest one that we talked about in the video, and you saw a picture of the little blue one, that only has eight tables. It's profitable June, July, and August. But it opens up for spring break. So it actually breaks even during spring break month of March, but loses money in April and May. And it breaks even, it's so close to breaking even in September, uh, and then by the end of October, it's losing money again. So, but you have to come up with hours that make sense, and you can't just be open when you want and closed when you want on the busy, busy days, because people want to trust you. Um, and, and there's bu other businesses around, you don't know what's going on with them either, right? So other businesses tend to, they'll shut down for the winter, and then all of a sudden you're busy, and you didn't expect that. So uh, you just kind of have to pick and choose your battles. That location there, it breaks even throughout a year, and it's more of a, uh, promotional thing that we use for our business. It's, we know that it's not going to make money, but it pays for itself. And it's in such an excellent location. It's literally right on the edge of the earth. Um, and there's a place called the Devil's Punch Bowl right next to it. It's a super huge tourist attraction. Uh, and you just kind of take the good with the bad sometimes. And you just learn to deal with it. No questions over here yet. This is the quiet side. Yeah, it's actually, uh, it's actually quite difficult. Um, so in our business, we have, uh, there's certain members of the family that are, um, it, it also changes your sort of like your political views, right? So I, I tend to be uh, quite uh, Republican and my sister tends to be quite uh, Democratic in, um, in views. And, and so 
it does change how we do things. We currently are uh, in the process of, of doing one of the things that she likes to do, which is um, be uh, sort of socially conscious to the environment. So in Oregon right now, straws are a big deal. And I think maybe you guys have heard about you know, the sea turtles and the straws and all these things. And so um, but part of our contract with Pepsi is uh, Pepsi product, cups, lids, straws. And so we were toying around the idea of going with paper straws, which, worked, which seemed to work for about 30 seconds, but, um, but they're more socially appropriate in Oregon. In Oregon, if you don't recycle, you're, you're an evil person. So we, we are very uh, environmentally conscious, uh, just not just because it's right to be, but because it's important for us to be that way. And we pride ourselves in being uh, you know, recycling and everything. But she really wanted to go to paper straws, and we did. And the Pepsi company got really upset with us. And so we've, all of a sudden we were violating the contract because we weren't buying straws from them anymore. So, we had to, so that became an issue that we had to kind of work out. And uh, there's, there's other things like that come up. Um, but yeah, being a member of the church, uh, I come from a different place as far as where, how I think in my mind, how things should operate, how we treat people. Uh, employee meetings that I run are different um, than the way that she runs employee meetings. But they're both effective in different ways. Um, but my family, they, they've learned to uh, appreciate the, uh, the benefits of um, me being a member of the church. Um, and they, they've, they've, they, they're, they're very, I grew up very unreligious at all. So they have really no care either way. But it doesn't really affect, I mean, we do sell alcohol at our businesses, but we have for 70 years. That's not really something that I personally can change since my mom and my sister are both owners of the business as well, and um, I would be uh, voted out of, of, of that option. And um, as far as being open on Sundays, it's the same thing. Um, if you, if, like Chick-fil-A can do it, because that's part of their business program, and everybody knows that. And in Oregon, there's very few restaurants on the, on the coast, and so if you're not open, there's people not available to eat uh, in their traveling. So it's, it's a service we offer, and it's also something that is up to them as well. So. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, no. So that was that, that was always part of the thing. I, I started at University of Utah in business management, and then I kind of migrated towards uh, tourism um, uh, management because it just came so naturally to me. I took the classes. I just seemed to know all the answers. It just made sense. Um, but that degree didn't really. I didn't feel like it prepared me to run the business. I felt in my heart that I needed to come back. Like it was an obligation. And um, so I didn't, I, I would try to like push the obligation off and work for various businesses. General Electric was one in, at GE Capital. And I got a degree in finance and economics at Westminster because I just didn't feel like I was trying to push that off, like ignore that obligation in my mind. But it was just too strong. And ultimately, um, I ended up going back and working for the family business. And it you don't feel responsible to do it, but you sort of do in a way. And um, I've told my kids that they need to go spread their wings. I don't want them to have that same sort of guilt in the back of their minds that they need to come back and help the family business. So we'll see what happens with them. But any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I've been, I've been sort of thinking about that. Uh, you know, what would I do if I wasn't doing this? And my wife and I have talked about it a number of times. Um, I don't know, when I was in college, I wanted to be a day trader. And, um, and I just, I'd seen the movie Wall Street, and I thought, you know, I could be a day trader. I could be a corporate raider. This would be so fun. But I, that's part of, it's really not part of my personality to be that sort of ruthless. So I don't really know. So maybe we'll, we'll figure it out at some point. When I grow up, I'll, I'll let you know. I think that that's all the time that we have. Uh, yeah. One last question. Uh, we know it's been very successful and you guys have great food. What do you contribute if you're the reason why all the Well, we, we like to say that, uh, of course, you have to have a, a great product and you have to have great service. And if you don't have those two things, you, you really don't have a restaurant, right? So, but Moe's has succeeded because it was built on, on stories, and people have, 
the people in Oregon and uh, Southwest Washington and Northern California, everybody, everybody there knows about Moe's. And if they grew up eating there, they bring their families back, it sort of become like their family's tradition is our kitchen. And so it's just part of the coast experience. The, the Oregonian, which is the main paper in Oregon, uh, they had a poll. What, what are the top 10 things people think about when they think about uh, going to the Oregon coast? And going to Moe's was number three, ahead of going to the beach. It was crazy. It, yeah, so I think meeting the expectations that people have is hard. So some people, they come and they go, I don't get it. It's not good. I don't get it. I don't understand it. And, and they, they leave and they're not happy. Other people are like, it's everything I dreamed about. And so sometimes your, your lore can be too big for you to meet because they've heard about how great this place is, but they don't realize it's just a beach restaurant where families come. They literally come off the beach or off the bayfront and they've got sand on their feet and they come and eat clam chowder and fish and chips and they get it. And Moe's is a family style restaurant. So you sit down at a table of six, but there's only four of you. We're gonna sit two other people next to you. It's family seating. So we have a family style bowl of chowder. Uh, my great grandma was very much believed in, e in eating things family style. So it's very much like if you are socially uncomfortable, you may not be happy at most. But if you're a happy person that you like other people, you're just gonna love it and you're gonna get it. And uh, LDS people, for whatever reason, Love most. The missionaries, I feed the missionaries there once a week. They call me, can, I, I, can we come down there and eat? And I text the waitress, or I call the waitress. They text me, I call the waitress. Yeah, the missionaries are coming in, I'm paying for them. Okay, got it. Now they don't even ask anymore. They just, they have a, if they have a badge on, they get free food. So, and then, and then what they have, it, it's just one of those things that happens. It's just part of the culture of that. So, I don't know if that answers your question or not. My, my wife has a question, so maybe I... I was just going to mention, it's something that we talk a lot about as um, we're caretakers of a legacy. Maybe you could say that. Yeah, so that was it's one of the things that my sister and I mentioned when we were uh, speaking at the Austin Family Business Program at Oregon State is, uh, that, so these are, we talk to students, uh, this group and larger, uh, they're just from family businesses, and uh, they all say the same thing. I have to go back and work for the family. What do we do? And it's like my sister and I always say the same thing. We don't, we're caretakers of a legacy. We don't, we don't run this business. It, it sort of runs us a little bit. We're just taking care of it for a little while and then it'll be another generation's turn to take care of it. And so, it's, it, hey, what do you do in a family business? You just, you make it work and you, and you love your family. I think we're out of time. Thank you for your time, appreciate it.